At 20 years of age, uh, you don't have um, a great deal of fear. It, it's all adventure. As a result, you're not necessarily frightened. Vietnam, when we were 20 years of age, we didn't really know where it was. We knew it was a country in Asia, and that was about the finish of it. Um, so for the first three months, we were still putting up wire, putting up mines, and we were continually patrolling to make sure there was no enemy entering towards our camp. We, we'd go out through the wire and it might take us an hour to do 200 to 250 metres. You'd take 10 paces, you'd stop, you'd listen. Wildlife was your best friend because it warned you if there was anybody else in the area. We uh, went up to Luscombe Field where we board the choppers and that we were being fired at in the air. I'd never heard uh, the sound of this before and I said to the Yankee uh, uh, side gunner, I said, what's that? He said, we're under fire and we will not be landing. So you'll have to tell your diggers that you've got to roll out backwards off the chopper. So we went straight into the edge of the jungle. We then learned that A Company had gone in and had eight casualties in, you know, 50 metres. Um, but there was a number of heavy machine guns to our front, plus there were snipers in trees. And so the order comes through, right, five platoon will take out the enemy position alone. And I said, right, I want everybody to fix bayonets. And when I say go, we're going to run straight at the enemy machine guns, although we can't see them, and take out the position. Um, well, as soon as I gave the order to fix bayonets and charge, every man in the platoon did. And three machine guns opened up on our right. So at that stage, I've got six of my blokes dead, 12 of my blokes wounded out of 27, so there's 18. I've got another seven of the reinforcements wounded. So they decided to send three armoured personnel carriers in to try and get my wound here. Well, I get nine of my blokes into the first APC, and with that, uh, the enemy counterattacked, blew the driver's head off, uh, wounded the commander. The medic he'd brought forward had lost an eye, it was blown out, and then he lost his leg as well. The next morning, we found my six dead, and one of my blokes was still alive, Vicky Otway. He's been in there all night with napalm being dropped, American bombs being dropped, all our own artillery being fired in there. He was badly wounded in both legs and knee, but he's still alive. My platoon in Vietnam, in the 10 years of the Vietnam War, my platoon's the most highly decorated platoon ever to serve there. I'm very proud of them because they were excellent soldiers. I think at 17 I would never have imagined uh, the experience I would face in my career. But I also look back and reflect and think there probably wasn't any other career path that I could have chosen uh, that would have given me such incredible opportunities in incredible positions of leadership at such a young age and the responsibilities that I had throughout my career. So, you know, I don't really look back with any regrets on having made that decision at 17 to join the Army.
Yes, I was serving on HMAS Canimbla. I was uh, the diving officer on board the ship. I was very fortunate to have been uh, the first woman in the Australian Army to have had that opportunity to become a Navy diver. But September 11th happens and on the way to the Middle East, I did have a boss, a major at the time, uh, but unfortunately he felt ill. And so I was promoted to now at the acting rank of major. But at 23, you know, this was a huge responsibility uh, to place on my shoulders. So these patrol bases are very isolated. They're very, very small bases, no bigger than the size of a tennis court. And you spend the day patrolling those regions around you, looking for violations of the peace agreements between Israel, Lebanon and Syria. The peacekeeping was really challenging. You had to have a whole different set of skills that you could pull out of the tool bag. But at the same time with the UN, I had this whole new set of experiences that was really exciting for me. The, the challenges to, to work with foreign nationalities, like even just some of those basic things of language skills, you know, and the ability to really impact the humanitarian aid that I'd always set out to want to do in my career. I was actually up on the rooftop of Kiam and I just happened to be looking south when I saw this 1,000 pound aero bomb that had been fired by an Israeli fighter jet. And it was at eye level for me, no more than 30 metres away. And I only just had enough time to tell my teammates to get down as that bomb impacted into the Hezbollah base. There was a fireball that erupted over our heads. And then the shrapnel started to rain down on top of us. We all somehow managed to scramble to the bunker. Not one of us really had a scratch on us. And it was, it was crazy to think that we'd all survived. After two days of trying to get through to the headquarters, I was told by my UN headquarters, Israel's about to conduct one of the largest airstrikes of the entire war. I didn't foresee that my driver was about to do evasive manoeuvring. And so I was actually thrown forward into the bulletproof windscreen of my armoured vehicle, which broke my back in five places. I then spent the next two days lying on a tile floor without any pain relief, without morphine. While the UN's now kind of scrambling just to come up with an alternative medivac process to get me to a hospital. But once I got to Cyprus, um, yeah, I was, I was told that uh, my teammates had all been killed at patrol base Kiyam. That, uh, Another 1,000 pound aero bomb that had, again, another Israeli fighter jet fired a 1,000 pound bomb, but this one was actually laser guided and, and that bomb instantly killed all four of my teammates, teammates that were manning that base. Unfortunately, as a result of my military service, I've suffered from post-traumatic stress disorder and just horrific flashbacks of that war. They live with you for the rest of your life and as a veteran you just somehow learn to deal with those, those, those incidents that have now shaped and moulded you to become the person that you are today. But you'll carry those experiences with you for the rest of your life. My parents came from England as World War I soldier settlers. I was three months old and of course that was hard times, were very hard because the depression was on, the conditions were so hard, we were so poor. You know, we used to go to school with bread and, bread and dripping sandwiches and uh, we didn't have shoes. It was so hard and, and it just became too much for mother. She packed us all up, the uh, four youngest children, and took us to the home and said, now, uh, as soon as I'm better, I'll come and pick you up. But she never did. She died. And then when the war broke out in 1939, and so what Dad did, he put his age uh, down to join the Army and he put my age up to join the Navy. His words were, 
I'm going to put you in the Navy, son, because I know you'll be safe there. And I just accepted that. I turned 16 June the 8th, and in July they called me. I was posted to HMAS Hobart. I hadn't seen a warship before. Going across the gangway, you couldn't imagine it. The whole ship was manually operated, so that's why you had a crew of upwards of 700. So I was a quarter deckman, and you manned the guns that are there. Well, I was 16 and a half, actually, when I joined the ship, but I was still doing a man's job. When we went over to the Middle East, we stopped on the entrance to the Suez Canal. But about one o'clock in the morning, uh, we had a very heavy air raid. And that was really frightening. I'd never seen an air raid before. Once I joined Hobart, I had a new family. In my three and a half years, the ship became my home, the ship's company became my family. The sea was calm, it was, the sun had just set uh, when there's this blinding flash and the, sh and the ship just rocked up in the air and rocked down again. That was when the torpedo hit. The safety valves actually blew off with the big bang. The, all the power went off. My job and my offsider had to go down below, put emergency power onto an oil pump. When the explosion hit, those four of the, my crew, they, I think they were all blown over the side. The guy that took my place, Died. He hadn't been on the ship very long, and, and I always think about that man. Well, I think about the others too, but more so the guy that took my place, Sable Simon Phillips. We were in Adelaide when the bomb was dropped and peace broke out. There were these great big celebrations, and I felt a loss. I felt the loss. I've got another six years to go and there's going to be no more excitement for me. That's what I felt. When I left the Hobart there, tears streamed down my eyes because that was my home. I didn't want to leave it. <laughs> You didn't know what to expect, so you got there and I guess you see Hollywood and you expect to hear a lot of noise, a lot of yelling, screaming, but everyone was just going about their business, doing their job. You know, the injured were, were quiet, the doctors were just doing what they had to do, the nurses doing what they had to do, and the quiet was uh, quite surreal, to be quite honest with you. So on the morning of the Bali bombings, um, 6.30 in the morning, did my usual uh, Bathurst ritual, get all the domestics done in the house before uh, sitting down in front of the TV to watch the race. Probably mid-morning to late morning, I got a call from the CO uh, asking me if I'd been drinking. It was a bit early in the day to start drinking, but I said no, and he said, well, make sure you don't and uh, pack a bag. You'll be heading north to uh, take some supplies up to Darwin and then on to Bali. We prepped the aeroplane. They loaded up the medical supplies. Uh, they took doctors, nurses and everyone who was going to assist up there, up to Darwin. We uh, grabbed more people, more equipment in Darwin, then uh, launched into uh, the flight to land in Bali the early hours of the morning. For me, being non-medical, a bit surprising because we thought we'd just land, we'd have all these people ready to go to put onto the stretchers and take them home, but and a lot of the time on the ground was spent waiting for people to be stabilised enough to air transport them home. I remember talking to one of the doctors at the time and, and uh, just asked about what was the issue with the burns and it was uh, an enlightening moment, probably in a bad way, that 
the effect that burns have on the skin, not in the way that I thought. It was more about the toxic nature of it and the shock that they go into and then the subsequent secondary effects that, that burns can have, particularly to 70, 80% of the body. Like I said, we'd land, stretches would be ready, we'd put them on, we'd go. But we were there for quite a few hours waiting for people to be stable enough to be air transported. So that was probably a, a reality check. The whole point of this role, you know, you, you, do, a, you do the military side of it, but then the humanitarian and aid is the stuff that really is rewarding. That's the stuff that, you know, you feel good about because that's ultimately what we try to do the best of our ability. We can always go where civilian aircraft can't go, be it a war zone, be it wherever. We, we always find a way to get there and uh, we have the range, we have the capability and we have the people who can do it. So, yeah, that's our role. Probably the most confronting of all the humanitarian stuff that I experienced personally would have been Arche. Flying over Arche and the devastation was very confronting. Like this went back hundreds and hundreds of metres and there was literally just destroyed homes and destroyed lives. And uh, I think taking food supplies, whatever we could into that area was probably the one that stood out the most. I mean, it affected the most amount of people. And while we're on the ground, um, some foreign doctors, I think they were Dutch, came over to us and asked if we could medivac a little baby that had just been born back in a humidity crib. We were able to medivac it to a, to a more substantial hospital and uh, reports we had later that day was the baby survived and was standing a good chance of surviving, so that was uh, one of the good stories. We, in the defence, particularly in my game, we don't understand the impact that it does have on your family. It's selfish from my personal point of view because I love doing what I do. So, yes, it may be viewed as selfless outside of defence, but I love doing what I do. And uh, I'm just so fortunate that my family support what I do, understand what I do, but I'd never stretch that support or understanding to the point where I'd break them. Because at the end of the day, I don't have them, I have nothing, right? So they're the ones who wear the brunt of me doing what I do more than I probably really appreciate. My family has uh, quite a long history with uh, the Australian Defence Force. Uh, when Australia became a nation, when they went away to, a, to war as Anzacs, uh, I had three direct relatives that landed on the beaches at Gallipoli. Every other male in my family from that point forward basically has served in the military at some point. I essentially finished my basic training to become a, an operator uh, and I was deployed immediately to Fiji. From that, uh, it just became relentless. It was Iraq, Afghan, Iraq. Basically, the last thing I did was get off the plane uh, from Afghanistan uh, and that was the day I discharged. Warfare has definitely changed, as we, we know, but war fighting in Afghanistan is unique. The big misconception is it's all desert. In many cases in the initial year or two years, that was the case because we had to prove the ground. We had to find out what was actually happening in the province we'd been allocated. So our, our focus was to, uh, to locate the senior members of the Taliban and to capture or kill them. That was the job. Luckily for the Special Forces, they started to bring in the regular soldiers. It enabled us to have uh, a number of fort operating bases which gave us a much better ability to project. So from our perspective, the war changed because we started to be able to target the enemy. It's still very surreal to me to, uh, to acknowledge that my you know, equipment and my medals are in the Australian War Memorial. Because when you fight, you're all fighting together. So the Victoria Cross, you know, is not something that you can earn by yourself. Each person in a battle of that magnitude has a part of that. You know, particularly because we've had such a contemporary conflict as Afghanistan. I think everybody knows someone or has a family member that's, that's served in Afghan, and it's been our longest war. Out in the sands of Afghanistan, there once fought a young brave man, a sapper, a soldier, family or mate, but to all he was nothing short of mighty and great. So for what he believed in, he came over here, and the sacrifice he made sure was dear. 
In this war, this desert fight, he gave his legs one Friday night. But without those legs, this is not his end. For those he loves, he will still defend. What I take away from my service on combat operations was that you will do anything for your mates because you've all got to come home. He had always wanted to join the army, especially from a very young age. My eldest daughter at the time, she was only a baby, and so he went and joined the reserves. Anyway, obviously got accepted and went to Kapuka and he was away for a long time. It was when he came home from the Solomons, uh, he really he saw another side of the army. He loved everything that he learnt and the training and everything, especially in the reserve side, and said, I really want to join full time. And I said, well, just do it. Just see how you go. Well, no matter where you go, if you get posted to Brisbane, Darwin or whatever, you know, we're, as long as we're together, does it really matter? Dave was 40, he had no rank. I think just one day one of them just called him Poppy because he was one of the older ones. He had loved the name Poppy. He loved the fact that the young fellas looked up to him in that way and called him Poppy. He admired his mateships a lot with his friends and the loyalty was a very big thing. He absolutely loved that side of it. Remembering Dad is a little bit difficult, obviously, at times growing up. He'd always pop out a camera and start filming my sister Stephanie and I and usually it's when her and I were singing or dancing and he would chase my sister and I around the backyard. It was the scariest moment, but still the funnest time ever, like growing up. He was a great dad. There was an option, I think, of Dave going either to Iraq and Afghanistan. I thought Iraq was actually the most dangerous. I remember when he came home the day that he said, I'm going to Afghanistan, and I, there was a part of me, went, I was really relieved. I went, oh. And he sort of gave me this look and just said, oh, that's actually the most dangerous place on earth at the moment. I'm going there. We dropped him off at the Brisbane International Airport. I just remember like saying goodbye for the final time and the elevator doors closing and little did we know that that was the last time that we would see him. The girls and I, Stephanie, Hannah and I, all got to speak to David on his birthday over there and um, we took a photo of a birthday cake and emailed it to him. Uh, I still have that email. he loved and adored, seriously, was his family. And, I mean, I know he, I'm his wife, but he's adored his girls. Stephanie and Anna were, were his life, so. I think it's emotionally confronting for me to be at the Australian War Memorial, mainly because those experiences that I've had during the Lebanon War are still so raw. Uh, the loss of my teammates is still, you know, it hits me every time that I come into this environment. I, I know my diggers' names are on the wall of remembrance out there, but they died as soldiers do die, carrying out an order, attacking an enemy force, and they were superb. The penny drops. It's like, wow, you know, this is named after David and it's a place for everyone that can come and reflect. It's the people that really knew Dad that go there and can just picture if 
they were all there in one spot, how connected it all be. I've got this great love of the Moore Memorial. I've been volunteering for 20 years. I look at the galleries and I look at the plaques on the wall. My own brother from Angau is on the wall. I never saw him after I left home. I go and say hello to him and I go and look at the Hobart, the Australia, the Sydney, the Yarra, all friends. I look at this and I just, I just pray for them. They were the biggest part of my life. They were my family and the war memorial is their home. Those names on the wall, they mean so much to me. Thank you.